This uh, is uh, more of a brief chapter for us that, since we just finished chapter seven dealing with reproduction and all the major components of reproduction. And quite a lecture that was. I can see how excited those that didn't come back today are. On 157, uh, in chapter 8, it just kind of continues the process of reproduction. Now that we see what all it takes, now this is going to be kind of the fertilization and the development process. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but actually, after fertilization, which we had mentioned in chapter 7, we, we create a zygote. Union of egg and sperm and the upper fallopian tube gives us a zygote. And they, they mentioned that on 157. And prevention of polyspermies on 158. And we mentioned the fact that once a sperm fertilizes an egg, the egg seals itself and prevents another sperm from fertilizing that egg. And that prevents polyspermy. So that's talked about on 158. We're making some good time now there. Now that we've got all that covered, we're going to turn to page 174. <laughs> on 174 are some test questions. The reason I won't miss out. There's three germ layers that start developing. After fertilization, we start uh, dividing mitotically this zygote into an embryo, into a fetus. And so we go from one cell to two cells to four cells to eight cells to 16 cells, 32, 64, here we go. And, and it's happening pretty, pretty rapidly. We've, we've got this sped up. So we reach a point that we create three germ layers. And we even saw back in the worm chapters and a lot of the uh, protozoan chapters, they, they called, even all of those, they call them triploblastic. This is where they get the term. We're triploblastic. Ectoderm, ecto would be referring to the outside, right? The ectoderm gives rise to the epithelium of the body surface and to the nervous system. Now it amazes me that one layer can do two different systems that's so different. The skin and the nervous system. I mean, that's a huge difference, isn't it? Then your second layer, the endoderm, gives rise to epithelial lining of the digestive tube. And then the mesoderm, the third germ layer, will form the muscular system, reproductive system, peritoneum, which holds all your intestines in place, and in some animals, um, like sea stars, some calcareous plates, they, they, vary, they vary off of that a little bit. But here we have one layer doing muscular system, reproductive system, and peritoneum, that's, that's pretty, pretty broad too, but that's where they get the term tripoblastic, and you'll need to be familiar with those. Now on 177, they get back into the mammalian, placenta, and early mammalian development. And again, like we had talked about in the mammalian chapter, they're going to they're gonna repeat themselves a little bit, talking about the differences in the monotremes, which is duckbill platypus and spiny anteater. They uh, produce eggs. They, they lay eggs. They don't have placenta. Uh, they obviously are not... Uh, raising them internally through the gestation process, it's by way of eggs, but they produce milk so they fall in the marsupial, or fall in the mammalian category. Then your marsupials, we said, uh, didn't really have a placental attachment, but they did grow them inside of uterus, which I guess is good enough, but the main thing is the milk production, and kangaroos don't specialize in gestation, but long uh, specialized milk production. Low fat milk for the older joey, high fat milk for the younger joy. And then the placental mammals, uh, which is 94% of the mammalian class, uh, have this remarkable fetal structure of the actual placenta. And uh, it is a very remarkable structure. And it is an endocrine gland during pregnancy. Once we get past about eight weeks of pregnancy, it takes over the entire pregnancy. And of course, when the child is born, what comes shortly after the child? The placenta. So when you lose that much hormones at once, you ever heard of postpartum depression? That's what may happen in some of those cases when, if you lose the whole gland, the hormonal levels kind of just drop off the face of the earth. So it, it can be explained a little bit that way. But the uterus is specialized in long-term, specialized housing for the developing offspring, which is be a fetus at this point, embryo to fetus. 
And uh, that gives us the three categories of different specialties that they have. Now it takes us over to 178. And uh, one of the last things we discussed in chapter seven was what brought on the onset of labor. What did we finally decide on that? We're not sure. And that's, that's where everybody's really at on that. We're not sure. So let's discuss this a little bit because I don't think we got in a lot of depth for this the other day. What brings on the onset of labor? All we know is that a pain hits, they become consistent, they shorten up time, and a kid comes eventually. Water breaks. What? Water breaks. Yeah, water's going to break somewhere in there. Sometimes breaking of the water makes this thing go a little faster. Uh, sometimes the water won't ever break, it drags it out, so the doctor has to break the water to speed this thing up. Yes? Is that the worst? Well, after you have four or five kids, you figure out what works best for you <laughs> if you go that far. So, But uh, with studies, of course, we relate studies of other animals to humans, and we relate human studies to other animals. And, and uh, although there's a lot of correlation among all mammals, there tends to be slight differences in all these little groups. And if we could actually put our hand on it in humans, it'd be wonderful, but apparently we, we can't just nail it down. So this is what we know. We know in our studies with other animals that uh, at some point the uterus becomes sensitive to the point it, it starts what, what's called fake contractions. Humans even have this, Braxton Hicks contractions. Now that's an indication of the uterus becoming more sensitive in the latter stages of this pregnancy. Now, are they consistent? Not really, they're kind of all over the board. They come and go, you never know when, you never know when they'll quit. All of a sudden, oh my gosh, there was three contractions five minutes apart. It must be in labor. Then they go away and don't see them for three weeks. Uh, who knows? So we know a point of sensitivity comes into play. In other animals, what we see, the progesterone that's maintained this, this pregnancy for this length of period of time, we see in other animals it starts to decline. And we see estrogen start to rise. And when estrogen goes above progesterone, it creates more of a sensitive uterus. And now, the slightest thing may fire off this uterus to do some serious contracting. And when it does, that sends a message to the posterior pituitary, or really the hypothalamus, I guess, which sends a message to the posterior pituitary and says, we need some oxytocin. Because oxytocin will fire that uterus even stronger. And a stronger contraction requires more oxytocin. And more oxytocin, a stronger contraction, and this goes on course it's a process of labor we it depends on the person how long it goes what is the average labor time for first first child 18 it's about what it runs uh, some will be 12 and, and then the one woman that has a six hour labor everybody else won't slap her because she should have <laughs> suffered as long as they did right but there are those cases in in humans we don't see the progesterone levels dropping what we see is progesterone stays high, but somehow estrogen creeps up above it. We really can't explain that. Now, that initial strong contraction, that's the big question. What kicks it off? Well, in other animals, they believe that the adrenal cortex of the fetus produces a cortisol that triggers that initial response. When, and that, what it's saying is that that fetus is now ready to be born. A mature level has reached the, the gland, the adrenal cortex, and it produces the cortisol and says, we're ready. And they're leaning more and more toward that explanation in humans. But really, what have we learned from this? Nothing. Because <laughs> we really don't, still don't know yet. So that's kind of where we're at. Getting to that labor point, though, we have what's called germinal periods, embryonic periods, and fetal periods. Now, let me put this in reality perspective. When, as, a, as a pregnant female goes to a doctor, the doctor's going to talk to you in weeks, not in months. They're going to talk to you in trimesters, not in months. Um, the, the way this book says this, germinal period, embryonic period, that's really the first trimester. If you read the description, it covers the first trimester. The first trimester is very crucial. This is a very sensitive time in developing a lot of pieces and parts in this embryo. 
What's the first major organ to develop in a developing fetus? Heart. That's it, the heart. That's pretty crucial because we need it to pump stuff everywhere else to develop it, see? So the heart. Okay, so now that we're, we're in this development stage and, and the heart's the first one to be, to be produced, we're, and as we go through this first trimester, we're continuing to finish up development of everything, at least the beginning of some things. The second trimester, the, the, the embryo slash would be fetus now, is more sensitive to outside. Uh, the latter part of the second, it can uh, maybe even start hearing voices. Uh, it, can, it can respond to outside stimuli. It, it recognizes parents' voices. Uh, and you get into the what they're referring to as a fetal period, which is the third trimester. This trimester is basically growth. Bottom line is this, this baby's getting bigger, getting bigger every day. Everything's pretty much developed. We're maturing some things. The lungs don't develop. Really, 36 weeks is a magical number for lungs. Beyond 36 weeks, we have very little problems with, with lung function if the baby's born. Below 36 weeks, we have significant problems with lung function because they're one of the last things to mature. Now, the nervous system, it doesn't finish maturing until after you're born, six months to a year after you're born. And some of these, uh, we've seen pictures of these children in other countries starving to death. They're, they have arms the size of toothpicks and they have this big mal malnourished belly and They've, they've done studies in those countries, and what they found that in the first year of those children's lives, being malnourished, uh, lacking proper food sources and protein being one of those, that these children lost 15% of their brain cells and never have the opportunity to develop those again because after a certain point, the nervous system's done. That's all it's going to do. And so, with it still developing, proper nourishment and nutrition is essential to continue the development of that child as far as the nervous system goes. So it's, uh, it's brutal, but that's, that's what the study says. So if we look at their germinal period, embryonic period, it tells you that the first two weeks is a germinal period. You know, it's about the size of a germ the first two weeks, and you may not even know you're pregnant. I mean, that's how small this thing is. The embryo is quite resistant to outside influences. During the next eight weeks, when all major organs are being established, so this is all in the first trimester, uh, body shape and everything starting to form, that's called the embryonic period. The embryo is more sensitive to disturbances that might cause malformations. This is a at the end of the first trimester and just the very, very beginning of the second trimester is the time in which if if mom's doing drugs and smoking and whatever else, and, and maybe she decides to go bungee jumping and do some water skiing and maybe fall off a cliff, she's gonna cause damage to this embryo and possibly even lose it. As a, we're, we're right into the fetal stage at this point, but it still can be lost, although past eight weeks, the placenta takes over, there's still nothing says that we can't pull that placenta apart by doing crazy things or sending drugs down in there to do crazy things. It's, we can still cause a lot of damage. This is a very sensitive to the exterior process here. In fact, it says uh, more sensitive to drugs and alcohol there in this time frame than any other, and that's in the that's in the really the first ten weeks. The latter part of the first ten weeks, first trimester, that's the most sensitive time that we could damage this development. And then the fetal period, primarily a growth phase. Although organ systems, nervous system, endocrine system continue to differentiate, the fetus grows from approximately 28 millimeters and 2.7 grams at 60 days to approximately 350 millimeters and 3,000 grams at term, which they use nine months, but 38 to 40 weeks is normal. Okay, any questions there? Well, they list on 181 that the pacemaker or the heart is the first developing organ. That pretty much sums up chapter 8. So we're ready to move on to what, what's our next chapter there, Darren? 33? There it is. The old nervous.
this this well, they start this chapter. This, this chapter covers taste, smell, hearing, sight, and all the components that takes things in and out of that. And the what is the functional unit of the nervous system? Anybody? The brain. The brain. We hope it functions. <laughs> I think we debate that sometimes. If it's functioning or not. But even a smaller entity here. This functional unit of the nervous system is a neuron. It's a neuron. And we have different kinds of neurons. <coughs> we, have, uh, we have association neurons. <coughs> These are also called uh, interneurons. We have sensory neurons which are all often called afferent. And then we have motor neurons, which are called efferent. Now those are three different types of neurons. Association or interneurons are found in the central nervous system. They're the most abundant. They're found in the brain in the spinal cord, in, in the system, and they're all the most abundant. Sensory neurons, they're everywhere. They're picking up information out here and sending it to the association neurons. So sensory neurons take information to the central nervous system. Motor neurons bring information back from the central nervous system. For instance, you reach and touch something hot. The sensory neuron picked that up and said, oh my, that's hot sends it to the association neurons that may or may not go to the brain, depends on the information, and, and quickly sends a response back way, by way of motor and says, move your finger before it burns off. <laughs> now, if we think through this process, our finger's already smoking, isn't it? <laughs> That's a reflex, isn't it? So, in a reflex arc, you have several, you have all these involved in a reflex arc. And in a reflex arc, you you have a stimulus that causes it. It's not part of the reflex arc, but it causes it, so hot caused it, right? And a receptor, receptor probably on the skin, let's say for this, for this case. Receptor picks up the information, sensory carries it to the association neuron, which immediately interprets the fact this is bad, sends it back by way of motor neuron to an effector, and effectors are muscles or glands that will respond to this problem. So, for instance, uh, let's say we're let's say we've been cooking something, and we know the skillet's been hot. All right. So we know it's been hot. So we we test it. Say, oh, it's cooled off pretty good. We can. We didn't want to walk over there and get the pot all right? So we. We grab it, and we get about right here, and we already know, we knew ahead it was hot, so we got a chance for mind over matter here. We get about right here and say, whew, that's a little hotter. You know, we're going through all of, but we're hanging on to it because we think we can make it to the sink. We don't want to clean up this mess, so you kind of get over there and toss it in the sink. So that's a, you can have a mind over matter. But in the case of a skill that's been sitting there, you know, why it was sitting there yesterday, you didn't know somebody used it today, so you just reach over and grab it, and you get it about right here, what's reflex tell you? You was not pre-prepared for this, so boom, there it goes. Here's a classic case of a reflex. I think Nick was two. And this was a birthday for Nick. And uh, well, of course we had grandparents coming over, you know, a big wife's always planning birthday parties and I'm always having to do all work, it kills me. But we've got a cake in the oven, right? Wife's in the back getting ready because everybody's coming over. We gotta look good. I'm probably standing there in my overalls, I don't know. <laughs> and she hollers, get that cake out of the oven. Of course, being the husband I am, I live to serve. I grab both pot holders she had sitting right there by the stove, reach in the oven, I get the cake out, I get about right here, headed for the cabinet. And one of the pot holders she set out for me has this monster hole in it. <laughs> well, as I turn, my hand catches that pan. Well, we had cake on the floor. Reflex says drop cake on floor. 
And with that, uh, she said, cake done? I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> it's done, all right. Fortunately, we had just mopped the floors, and I felt real good about the floors being clean. <laughs> and so I raked the cake back in the pan, cleaned up. I'll go ahead and put the icing on while it's hot, let it just kind of smooth out good. So I put the icing on, it just smoothed in there, and I got everything smoothed out real good. And, and then, being the father I am, I suggested that when, when the boy blows the candle out, just let him dive in wherever he wants to. And I had that dove in part turned right there. You can just see Nick now, can't you? Chocolate everywhere, but he tore up the part that was tore up. And to this day, if you tell my wife, I will fail you. <laughs> she still does not know to this day. Nick has just recently found out because I told the story in the class he was in. So and I swore him a secrecy or I beat him to death. So being the servant I am, the buffaloes ought to get y'all a husband like this. <laughs> but that's definitely a reflex. Oh my gosh. It hurt. Just briefly though. But uh if we had to think about these reflexes, it'd be too late, wouldn't it? It'd just be too late. All right, the rest of this chapter is, a, let's see. Let's, let's differentiate a little bit in peripheral and central nervous system. What do we know about the central nervous system? Not all at once. I can't understand you when you're talking to me all at once. Central nervous system. <coughs> Very good. Yeah, I knew I'd give you an easy one to start with. What do we know about the peripheral nervous system? That's right. That's the most common answer. You know how big the peripheral nervous system is? Everything else is huge. It's a, it's a monster out there. Now, we've got the central nervous system really running the show. It's, it's interpreting, it's responding, it's, it's, it's the big shebang for the brain behind this deal. So there's, there's 31 pair of spinal nerves that extend out uh, and makes up the peripheral nervous system. And there's 12 pair of cranial nerves that extend out and help make up the peripheral. So we've got feelers out there, don't we? There's a lot, can you imagine how many times those nerves branch again and branch again and branch again? It's pretty big. So when we talk about the central nervous system, uh, we talk about the brain. Well, name, name the parts of the brain. Cerebral. 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 Everybody's favorite. The medulla oblongata. We'll just put medulla. I would agree those are the major components. Which one's the largest one? Cerebral. Cerebral, largest part of the brain. Um, Aristotle, when he first started studying the brain, he, he said the purpose of the brain was to cool the blood. Now think about that. Where do we lose a lot of heat? Off our head. That, that wasn't a, a bad observation for the time. Now we look, look at it now and say, he was a little off. Now, we, we lose a little heat off the top of our head, but there's a little more purpose there. What he really was noting is that there's a lot of blood goes there. And the brain gets a, it gets a set amount of blood all the time, or it just shuts things down. I mean, it's pretty selfish when it comes to that. So Aristotle uh, made that observation, and then there was another guy named Sir Charles Sherrington that made an observation about the brain and said the brain is the great raveled knot. Well, if you look at a picture of it, it kind of looks like just a knotted up mess, doesn't it? And he said the brain is something we'll never understand because we're trying to understand the brain with a brain in which we don't understand. Again, there's a lot of wit in those statements if you think about it. You think we'll ever understand the brain completely? No, because we don't have the capability to understand it. So those are some pretty good, pretty good observations. Now, if we take the cerebrum and break that cerebrum up into different parts, can anybody name some lobes? Temporal lobe. I heard temporal. Occipital. Occipital. Parietal. 
Very good. Throttle. <laughs> Somebody missed that one. Didn't <laughs> Throttle, temporal. I hope I spelled right. Is that right? Occipital and parietal. What what's our specialties here? Frontal lobes. What's it what's it specialize in? Memory. What? Memory. There is some memory in it. Absolutely. What else? It's really noted for personality, language, and some memory. That's what it's. So if you know somebody's got a messed up personality, now you're going to think their frontal lobe's a little screwed. <laughs> <laughs> you, ever, you ever know somebody that, uh, I mean, you've known them for a long time, and then, then, a, then a sad event like a major uh, car wreck or, or they had some traumatic head injury, and then you think, man, they're just not the same. You ever know somebody like that? When I was in high school, uh, we was actually playing in the county tournament here on Carl Edwards Field. It was a final of the county tournament against Spyro. We was big rivals with Spyro. We had a good team. Spyro had a great team. And, and we were battling tooth and toenail. And Spyro had hit a fly ball in the gap between left and right. The left and center, actually. That would be between left and right, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't even know my outfield anymore. And uh, we had a good outfield. They was fast, and there was nothing going to hit the ground. I mean, they went after it hard. Left fielder dives like this. Center fielder's left-handed. He dives like this. Left fielder's knee catches center fielder right there. Mm -hmm. To this day, I couldn't tell you if they actually catch the ball or not, but it wouldn't have surprised me that somebody didn't roll over and say, I got it. <laughs> but the center fielder was never the same again. In fact, the doctor told him he never needed to play sports again. Another blow like that would have killed him. And he's so dang stubborn-headed. He's just a junior. He had to play. So the doctor approved him playing on one condition. He wore a helmet everywhere he went. He wore a helmet playing center field. If he pitched, he wore a helmet. If he batted, he wore a helmet. He was never to take a helmet off. And he finished his senior year. Now, he could still run. He could still hit. But his personality, it, it was still different. I mean, I could, I could have y'all talk to a couple of the sophomores at the time. When we turned seniors, we was at a ball game down in Smithville, and it was the finals of Smithville tournament. I'll get back to this game because uh, we were delayed on it. To, we didn't finish the game. Ambulance come on the field, and that kind of, we just shut down the game. We finished it later. We won. <laughs> but. Uh, Senior, that was junior year. Senior year, we're in the final Smithville tournament, and we're getting beat. I don't know what school it was, six nothing, I think, in, a, in the fifth. And uh, us seniors wasn't real happy. We had a couple real good sophomores. There's Athlon, and there's little, there's sophomores. There's joking and cracking up, you know. We had a rain delay. Field's getting wet, and they're working on the field, trying to get back going again, and these two sophomores goofing off over there. And this guy with this traumatic brain injury, one of them says something to him, and I thought he's going to kill him right there. He made a believer out of them, I'm telling you. They still talk about it to this day. Both of them said, I never messed with him again. <laughs> he was serious about winning. But we won that game 7-6. to six, And I think it was the fear he put in those two sophomores because they hooked it up and started playing ball then. <laughs> but uh, it, he never was the same. And, and in fact, he has since passed away. It's one of the four classmates I've had since I've graduated high school that's passed away. And, so you wonder if that didn't have an effect, long-term effect, on his longevity in life because of the brain injury that came from that. All right, so personality, language, a um, little bit of memory. Temporal, on the side next to your ear, hearing, yep. Occipital, in the back, right opposite your eyes. Your vision actually crosses over as you use two eyes to get parts of the image from both eyes to make one good image. So it's occipital, it's vision. Parietal lobes lies along the top, along the longitudinal fissure. And the parietal lobe uh, does things like touch, pressure, and pain. Uh, somesthetic and somatosensory responses is like what the parietal lobe does. All right, now with that said, I'm going to tell you a little story. I was trying to stay in front of it. Was it getting too far out of the way? You probably got the back of there as big head, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> It's in all, most all the films, your hat or your head. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to tell you a story, and you tell me which lobe was damaged to this guy. The story is about a railroad worker named Gage. 
And uh, this was way back when they was putting down rail and they didn't have track hose and back hose and bulldozers. They had a team of horses, dynamite, and gunpowder. And this guy worked alone in most everything he did, but his job was to remove obstacles in the way of laying that rail down. So if there's a big boulder out there, the way he had to move it to make it into small boulders and get them out of there. So he was all the time blowing up something. That was his favorite thing to do. So he, he had a big boulder this particular day. He had taken and worked out a little crevice into this boulder enough to get some gunpowder packed in there to start cracking this boulder a little bit. So he's tamping this gunpowder in with a three foot steel pole is what he's tamping it with. Well, while he was tamping it, he throws a spark. When he throws his spark, it, of course it blows up in his face and it blows that three foot steel pole through his left eye. Now, it, it actually came up through the chin, through the eye, and come out the top of the brain. And it, it said it blew him away from the side a significant amount of feet. I don't know how far, but I, I can imagine it, it jarred him back a ways. Did not kill him. Uh, knocked him out for a while. It didn't say how long, but when he come to, I'm sure he had a lot on his mind. <laughs> I added that to the story, child. <laughs> Can you imagine the headache the guy had? He comes to and he's got this three foot steel pole sticking through his head. And back then their only means of transportation was getting on a horse. So if he got on a horse, can you imagine riding a horse <coughs> into town? Jarn, here we go. Yeah, we've got serious headache going on now, don't we? So he, I can see him walking up, he's Dodge City, walks up to Doc, knocks on the door. Doc says, Gage, what's on your mind today? <laughs> well, obviously, I added that to the story, too. <laughs> <laughs> they removed the three-foot steel pole, and then they described Gage afterwards. He lived through this, and they described Gage uh, previous as being a, a person that took care of things. He showed up for work, he did his job, he took care of his family, he, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't have a lot of bad habits. He was just a pretty straight up guy. And now after the after the injury, Gage uh, may or may not go to work. He gambled a lot, he drank a lot, he cussed. Things he never did before. So they said Gage was not Gage anymore. So what, what lobe was damaged? Frontal lobe. His personality was totally Almost, almost right opposite of what it was before. He lived through it, but he wasn't the same person anymore. So, there it is. Now, there's another story I'll tie into all this eventually, but uh, let's talk about the peripheral, service, the peripheral nervous system. Since it's everything outside the central nervous system, just how big is that? Well, it's big enough that uh, peripheral nervous system breaks off in the somatic system. We should have put that in this aisle today. We should have moved you to the middle aisle. And the autonomic system. The autonomic system breaks off into sympathetic and parasympathetic. I call those the pathetic systems. And the Sympathetic breaks off into uh, adrenergic and uh, cholinergic. And adrenergic breaks off into who's going to take physiology next semester? Or the next semester. You might want to share possibly. Well, this is this is some of the stuff you're gonna get. We're not gonna dive in a lot of depth here, but we will. The somatic system deals with uh, voluntary functions, skeletal muscle, things that we voluntarily can do on our own. The rest, everything else happens without you thinking about it. This is a fight or flight reaction. This is your everyday, I love what, how this book states this. Sympath the parasympathetic system deals with your everyday vegetative, mundane activities. How low is vegetative? That's ground level, isn't it? That's where your vegetation is. It doesn't get any lower than that. Basically, that's uh, eating and peeing. 
drinking in the middle there somewhere. It's like, I'm laying on the couch, thinking about food, I need to go pee, but I don't want to. Y'all ever been there? I know you buffaloes there. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there at some point. And us guys uh, holler at the wife and say, uh, bring me something to be in. <laughs> Probably would, wouldn't it? So this breaks off into some more specific stuff here, but I, I think just looking at the flow chart tells you just how big the peripheral nervous system and what kind of effect it really has out there. This is fight or flight. And on physiology, I have, uh, I have an ongoing question throughout the semester. It's on every test. But the scenario is this lady is being chased by a big black bear from Arkansas. Now that has nothing to do with a question, but it's a big, mean black bear from Arkansas. And every question it will state that. And then it then it tells what's what what the lady's having to do to survive this this chase. This is ongoing all semester. She's she's got quite a longevity about her to, to run forever. At the end, the bear finally catches her and decides she wasn't worth catching. So, <laughs> but there is a, an ongoing question. And it's all sympathetic. There's so many things going on for her to survive. There's adrenaline going in one of the questions. There's there's uh, anotrophic and chronotrophic effects, which increase heart rate and increase heart strength is going for her to be able to survive this. Increased respiratory rate is all going to survive this. When the sympathetics work in the parasympathetics, not this one has complete override. Uh, this one works only in the absence of sympathetic. So, you know, we have a system that gets us through stressful times. We're just not made for long-term stress. You know, a whole semester being chased by the bear, chances are stress may have actually killed her in the end. I didn't put it that way. We didn't end that bad, but that's the case. These are things we don't think about. We don't have to think about. They just happen. It's, you can almost think of it as automatic, but they tell you not to think of it that way, but really it's, it's happening automatically without you thinking about it. So I think that helps sum up what the peripheral nervous system is kind of all about. All right. Uh, covered quite a bit of that as we went. Let's uh, mark page uh, like 730, 731. And uh, we'll, we'll start Thursday, today is Thursday, we'll start Tuesday with, and you might put this in your notes to remind you, we're going to actually see, or I'll draw up there how a neuron functions, how, how, how we transmit information. That's where we'll start, and we'll get the, the nervous system part of this summed up, and we'll be in the eyesight here. It'll take a couple more class periods.